Welcome, everyone, to my talk, Explaining Distributed Systems Like I'm Five. Before we start, let me introduce myself super briefly, I promise. I'm Michele. I work as a senior software architect at Nearform. I'm a good developer expert and a Microsoft MVP. Uh, we are professional services companies, and we maintain a lot of open source stuff. So if you are interested in talking about Node.js specifically, uh, you will find me around. So the idea for this talk started during an online course. Um, every Monday evening, I do a free online course with a dear friend of mine, which is called Gabriele uh, Santomaggio, who's a staff engineer working in the core team of RabbitMQ and knows something about distributed systems. And we are preparing juniors developers uh, for upskill and also um, non-tech people entering the tech industry. So at a certain point, we decided to go into distributed systems. So this is me with my friends and Gabriele. And, uh, the problem was, what problems do distributed system solves, right? It's not easy uh, to make junior developers understand that concept, especially for you know, uh, non-technical people to get into distributed systems. So we wanted to do something to let them understand this. And so we came up with the idea of talking like to a five years old guy uh, and see if we can try to teach something. But we started with a very simple requirement. So we asked them to create an API that uploads a very large CSV file, which must be greater than 10 gigabytes in size, to a server. Then once we have the file, read it, normalize the data, and store it into a database. Uh, that's not just nice as an exercise, but also as an interview question, in case you're you know, <laughs> looking for good interview questions. Um, so the vast majority of the students came out with the following diagram, right? So we basically are users. We upload something to the API server. The API server takes the uh, CSV files, normalizes it, and uploads to the database. So if we go in a diagram, uh, in, a, uh, in that kind of diagram, we will see that we make a request. Web server process the file, uploads the data into the database, and after that, sends a reply to the final user. And that could take like, I don't know, 30 minutes? It depends on the internet connection you have. I'm from Italy, internet, co internet connection here is really, really bad, so you don't want to go that way. Um, also, this is a synchronous operation, so that means you are blocking people for uploading multiple stuff concurrently. And in fact, the biggest problem we pointed out during the review for this architecture was, what happened if we have dozens of concurrent uploads? So it was pretty easy. Uh, we start uploading and processing a few large files, and we run out of memory. So after that, uh, the most advanced <laughs> junior developers in the course said, OK, great, so why don't we just take a load balancer? You know, uh, We create a couple of servers, and if one is busy, we can write direct to the other one, and we can scale horizontally like forever. True, it's part of the solution, but doesn't fix the problem. So this is what I want to introduce you, the ice cream scenario. So who loves ice cream? Awesome. OK, cool. You're going to like this. So let's pretend you, uh, you're an ice cream maker, and you have a beautiful ice cream truck. And eventually, you're in Amsterdam, and you find a lot of people which is really angry, and they all want ice cream. So there is a lot of people. And as people came by, you start distributing you know, ice creams, but you don't have enough capacity. So there is a lot of people, and people continue to increase. and. There's nothing else you can do. So how do we deal with that kind of problem in real life? Any suggestion? More ice cream trucks. That's true. But before getting new ice cream trucks, we have to deal with that problem. So we create queues. Then we get there. <laughs> You're totally right. Um, so yeah, we can start creating queues. But what happens if we really have a lot of people? You know, there are kids, and people treat kids poorly, or um, so uh, tries to cut the line, whatever happens. So we want to ensure that the first person arriving to the ice cream truck will be the first person to get served, right? So we hire a security guard. And that boy, uh, sorry, that girl will make it sure that everyone uh, will get served in the correct way. So if I'm the first, I will, get, uh, I will be served first. And of course, like we were saying, at a certain point, a single queue is not enough. So we'll get more ice cream trucks, more guards. And we can scale uh, in many different ways from now. But of course, when it comes to software architectures, 
<laughs> things get a bit harder, right? So this is where we want to introduce the concept of distributed systems. So a distributed system, by its definition, is a collection of independent computers that appears to its users as a one computer. That means that it doesn't really matter if we have like 10 ice cream trucks, if we have 100 ice cream trucks or one single ice cream truck. To the final user, what matters is the speed and the, the possibility to uh, ask for many different ice cream at the same time. So we end up in a similar situation. We don't really care uh, if we see ice creams. We only wait for waiters and waitress to give us our ice cream, right? And to call a system as distributed, it needs to um, respect three distinct rules. First of all, the computers in a distributed system uh, need to operate concurrently. And that's the case. So it means that if we are in the first food truck, uh, sorry, ice cream truck, uh, it operates independently from the other trucks. And also for uh, the queue and for the waiters and waitresses. All computers fail independently, which means that if an ice cream truck is on fire, it doesn't affect all the other ice cream trucks and definitely don't want to affect the waiters and the waitresses. And here we come to the most complex topic when it comes to distributed systems, in my opinion, of course. Uh, computers do not share a global clock. What does that mean? Let's say we have a couple of uh, watches, and we want to synchronize them to a unique source of truth. So we know for sure that like, uh, the, the golden watch in my slide is the correct one, pointing to the correct hour. And we want to synchronize two different watches to that hour. Well, this is. Technically speaking, impossible due to the current laws of physics limitations we face every day. And that's because when I make a synchronizing request, I make that request in a certain period of time, and there is some latency to reach the source of truth. And also, there is some latency in the response. So we can get really, really close to a correct hour, but we will never have synchronized hours. And if you think of that, for example, if I look at my watch right now, um, we have a limitation, which is the speed of light. So the light needs to be reflected on my watch and go back to my eyes. And this is latency, which is really tiny in that case, still exists. So we don't want our system to depend on clocks because they are not reliable in that sense. Of course, there are a couple of standards for, um, uh, for dealing with that kind of problems, and I just can quote them like network time protocol, NTP, and precision time protocol, PTP. Uh, there is an awesome article on geeksforgeeks.org that explains those topics in depth, uh, so I highly recommend you looking into those if you are interested in that topic. So, from now on, the solution we required to the students were, was a solution that could satisfy the following requirements. So the system, uh, all the computers in a system had to operate concurrently, independently, and they, had, they doesn't have to share a global clock, right? So uh, let's start from the, from the beginning. Was uploading a very large file to a server a good option in first place? I don't think so. That's because if you work, at, for example, I work in Node.js mainly, and you don't want to upload files and serve files from Node.js. Believe me, I love it, but that's not the best option. And that's also the case for other languages. So um, I would go with a more structured way for dealing with large file inputs and outputs. And that's the case for object storage, for example. It doesn't matter if they are SWS S3, Google Cloud Storage, Azure Blob Storage. We, we don't really care about the implementation right now. We just care about what we are doing. After we upload a file to an object storage, we could trigger a change in what we call the waiter, for example, in our ice, uh, ice cream truck, right? which in that case can be RabbitMQ, but could also be like a streaming service like Kafka, right? So we upload something to a bucket, bucket notifies Rabbit, and at this point, when a waiter is free, so they don't have to uh, bring some ice cream to people in queue, they can go back and take a new ice cream. So we have the concept of consumer. So the consumer, when it's not doing anything important, will pull from the queue and will be able to process the file. And Rabbit will keep the queue um, in a uh, lasting, 
yeah, last in first out uh, way, sorry, first in first out way, uh, such that the first person reaching for the queue will be the first person to get served properly. So the consumer will send the data to a database, and after we have the data in the database, we can eventually uh, ask for this data from an API server so that we can uh, query for, I don't know, um, e-commerce data or whatever we need from that server specifically. So the final diagram looks something like that. We are, a new, we are users, we upload uh, to an object storage our file, and we can subscribe like to an API server using WebSockets or whatever so that we can get notified, maybe with a different queue on our message broker or Kafka or whatever. Uh, we can get notified when the process is done and we can start uh, querying the database as soon as the data comes in. And also, we uh, fixed another problem. This is an asynchronous way of dealing with that kind of problems. So, have we respected the rules? Are the computer uh, operating concurrently? I would say so. Um, do computers fail independently? Yes, they do fail independently, and you may be thinking, right, um, okay, but if RabbitMQ crashes at this time, I'm not able to pull stuff. Okay, this is totally correct, uh, but you're likely to deploy them into clusters and whatever, so um, it's a very resilient uh, software, so I wouldn't be super concerned about that. Um, do computers share a global clock? Well, we don't actually care about that. Uh, and that's because it's more something we need to, uh, to care about when we are creating distributed software rather than architecture at this point. So what problems did, this solve? did we solve? Of course, we are not able to scale a very large scale application very easily, starting from a very single, uh, sorry, a very simple problem. And that's a lesson that I'd like my students to learn at this point, and maybe we can all learn something from simple, simple problems that can cause very complex solutions. So that was all for me. Thank you all for being here. I'll leave a couple of contacts just in case you want to reach out, and yeah, see you all around. Thank you.